So we are kicking off a new sermon series today in the book of Proverbs, and kids get to stay up here uh, during the summer. We're taking a little bit of a break. Uh, in July, the elders have asked all the ministry teams and uh, yeah, different kind of volunteer groups to take a little bit of a break, uh, to take a breather so that we can all rest together. And the children's ministry started a little bit early because they need a break. Let me pray for us, and uh, we will begin. Heavenly Father, thank you for today. Thank you for our time together in your word. Thank you for the book of Proverbs. Thank you for Thierry and the blessing he is to us as a church. I pray that you would um, bless all of us in your presence tonight through your word. Uh, We love you so much and we need you. We need your Holy Spirit right here to speak to our hearts, uh, to hear from you. That's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Uh, So we're kicking off a new series. Uh, We're in this Old Testament book, uh, this book of Proverbs. And uh, Proverbs seems kind of like a foreign word to us. It can, but I actually think we encounter Proverbs a lot in our life. In fact, I want you to think right now, we're going to go through some uh, uh, perhaps English Proverbs, and I, I want you to think, if I had one English proverb that I could define my life by, if I had just a proverb that I could say, this is kind of my, you know those life verses, everyone has a life verse, it's like their favorite verse. If I had a life proverb, what would it be? And so I wanted to share some of the ones that maybe you have encountered in your life. Maybe someone has shared it with you out of the wisdom of their heart, or you have shared it with someone else. Uh, What would that proverb be if you had one that was kind of your proverb? Maybe it would be this. If you want something done right, do it yourself. Maybe you said that, or it doesn't really lend itself well to this idea of teamwork, of kind of equipping each other. We want to be uh, sharing with each other, but we can, maybe, maybe that's your proverb. How about this one? This one's a little bit uh, uh, better. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. That's the golden rule, right? That almost sounds like the Bible. That seems like a, almost sounds like the Bible. That seems like a pretty good proverb. Or maybe you've heard this one. Good things come to those who wait. I wouldn't recommend making this your life (laughs) proverb because then you're going to wait a lot. Or maybe you've just waited so much, you're like, this better be my life proverb because I really want the good things to start coming. Uh, I know some of you that have this as your life proverb. One man's trash (laughs) is another man's treasure. I know a few people that uh, operate this way, and everyone's kind of looking around. You know what? Those of you that are laughing at the other people, this perhaps is your proverb, cleanliness is next to godliness. This is not a Bible verse. I think you need to, you need to stop and uh, take that in. This is not a Bible verse, just a general American or English proverb. How about this one? Some of you live that fortune favors the bold. On the other hand, some of you think if it's not broke, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Now, these are all good proverbs. They're fun. I think they're interesting. But what if you were to choose a proverb from the Bible? There are a lot of proverbs in the Bible. Uh, how about this one? Proverbs 15.22. Plans fail for lack of counsel, but with many advisors they succeed. What if you made that your life? Or maybe you already do. You ask people advice all the time. That's not a bad thing. That could be a real good thing. How about if you kind of want to make it a little bit more God-focused, and so you choose Proverbs 16, 9. The heart of a man plans his way, but the Lord establishes his steps. That could be a good proverb to choose for your life because, well, it's reminding you to just always trust in the Lord, and that's a a good thing. Uh, What if you made this your life proverb? The lot is cast into the lap, but its every decision is from the Lord. And you decided, from now on, I'm going to make decisions by casting lots. That would be an interesting way to live your life. You know, should I, should I uh, purchase Cheerios or honey bunches of oats? I better draw straws uh, because I want this decision to be from the Lord. Am I going to marry this person or am I not going to marry this person? Let's cast some lots. Uh, it, could, uh, uh, it could get you in trouble, I think. Now, this is just an illustration that... Uh, Proverbs are generally true, but they're not absolute truths. This is important as we jump into the book of Proverbs. It's easy to choose one proverb and say, ha, this says what I want it to say. 
But there are lots of Proverbs, and many of them are kind of on different topics. So there's a lot of Proverbs on money. And they have different things to say about generosity, about giving to the poor, about uh, saving up, about being wise with your money, about earning money. So there's, there's a uh, kind of a plethora, uh, dynamic perspective on money from Proverbs. You can't get it in just one Proverbs. You should read a whole bunch of them because they interpret each other. You don't want to just read one Proverb, just like you wouldn't, uh, you wouldn't hear like, many hands make light work. Well, that's generally true all the time, right? The idea is that if we all pitch in, it's going to go faster. We're going to get the job done. But what if those hands are baby hands? Is the job going to get done any quicker? No, it's going to take a long time. Elijah is not very helpful, but I love him. You're kind of teaching him to do it better. Anyways, Proverbs are not universal truths. They're general truths. They're trying to communicate something to us. There are some exceptions. Some are, and we're going to encounter those tonight, universal. Now, if we're not careful when we read Proverbs, they can really confuse us. How about this one? Proverbs 26, 9. Like a thorn bush in a drunkard's hand is a proverb in the mouth of a fool. I hope that you don't walk away from tonight's sermon thinking this uh, about uh, the message See, we want to understand Proverbs. We want to understand them in the right context. We want to understand how they all work together. And it's my prayer by the end of this series that we will understand how to read Proverbs and that it will turn from one of those books that maybe you read every once in a while to one that you really enjoy. Because as I've been studying, I've really grown to enjoy it. See, I think there are truths, there are, there are these truths, these, these powerful uh, nuggets of wisdom that the Bible has to offer us that can help us live a life that honors God, that can help us follow God in our everyday lives. And they're easy to remember. They're Proverbs. I think there is a proverb in today's message that you should make a life proverb. <laughs> That you should make a life verse, something that you come back to and you reflect on. And we're going to get to that, and we're going to slowly head towards that, that that proverb. We've already said it together tonight, but I kind of want to build up to it. And I want to, as we head that direction, I want to answer a couple questions. What is a proverb? Let's, let's talk. I mean, that might seem obvious to you, but let's stop and talk about it. Why proverbs? Why are we going through this book? And then who is proverbs for? Who's the intended audience? And then what's the big idea of Proverbs? And that's really where we're going to kind of get into this idea of a, of a proverb that we can take home and begin to put into practice in our own lives. So first, what is a proverb? We're going to be looking at verse 1. Now, as you look down at your Bible, uh, if you have the NIV, chances are that uh, there's this kind of section here. There's chapter 1, verses 1 through 7, and then you see maybe a header it's because verses 1 through 7 act as a preamble. That's not a word I use very often or in my everyday lingu- lingo. I don't just name drop preamble. Preamble is just an introduction. It's like a brief introduction, uh, and here we find it to the book. It's an opening statement. And Proverbs 1.1 1, 1 begins the preamble like this. It says, The Proverbs of Solomon, son of David, king of Israel. So there's a couple of things in there that we want to unpack. The word proverb comes from a Hebrew word, the word mashal. Mashal, and it, it means a short, pithy saying. A short, pithy saying that is easy to remember. Now, this, this, there's, there's this word in Hebrew, it has another word, that, uh, it has another meaning that looks exactly like it. And it's to rule or to govern, right? So same Hebrew word can mean a proverb or it can mean to rule or to govern. And I think what that means is as we see this word, it should invoke the other word and we should be thinking that proverbs are short, pithy sayings by which we can rule or govern our lives by. That we can use as a, as a, guide, as a guidebook, as a, as a playbook for our lives. And so, uh, with that in mind, I want to propose this as the definition of a proverb. Proverbs are brief, poetic sayings meant to teach us wisdom. Brief, poetic sayings meant to teach us wisdom. Now, this is my definition based on some of my reading and my understanding of proverbs. So maybe it'll morph, but I think this is a pretty good one. 
They're brief and they're poetic. Have you ever had that where uh, you were listening to someone and they said something that was brief and poetic and it just kind of moved you and it, and it made a, a, a statement and they could have said the same exact thing with like a lot more words but it wouldn't have moved you the same way? There was a, a short clip on, online, so you know, sometimes clips go viral, and this is a clip with Keanu Reeves and Stephen Colbert. So he's a, a late night show host, he's, he's interviewing Keanu Reeves, uh, I think it's Keanu Reeves, uh, the star of The Matrix, maybe you've seen that, maybe you haven't, he's, he's kind of like this long hair, dark beard, he was all wearing complete black, like black suit, black shirt, black tie, kind of a, a serious looking guy, but then the long hair kind of throws you off. Anyways, he's in The Matrix, uh, and he's a famous guy, and, and Stephen Colbert turns to him and says, what do you think happens when we die, Keanu Reeves? He sat back, and he took a deep breath, breathed in, he breathed out, and he's processing. What do you think happens when we die, Keanu Reeves? And he said, I know that the ones who love us will miss us. To which Stephen Colbert just like reached over and shook his hand. Good job. I know that the ones who love us will miss us. It sounded like a proverb, right? Now, obviously, this proverb is lacking the eternal, Christ-centered, gospel-filled perspective, but it's still beautiful and powerful and poetic. And that's similar to what we're talking about tonight, proverbs. Now, proverbs are special because they're not just pretty sayings. They're God's pretty sayings. They're they're pretty sayings that are found in God's word and that have something special to teach us. Proverbs are brief poetic sayings meant to teach us wisdom. Now, the Hebrew word for wisdom is the word chukmah. Chukmah. If you really want to get at it, ask Terry. He'll uh, Terry actually. Not maybe Terry. You know how to pronounce chukmah, but uh, uh, Terry is downstairs. I think tonight. And chukmah is this idea of the skill of living, the skill of living. But it's not just any kind of living, like living for the weekend or living for your bank account or even living for good things like your family. It's living for God. It's living in a way that honors God. It's living in a way that understands how God made us and how we should function how I should function individually, but then how we should function as a community, how, how my marriage relationship should function, how, how I should function with my, my finances or, uh, or uh, emotions or the way I interact with those around me. Because God does call us to interact with those things a certain way, to try to live life for God in our every day. Proverbs has everyday wisdom, everyday skill to offer us. See, wisdom can change every part of our life. Wisdom can change your marriage. As we begin to do our marriage the way God intends instead of the way that is natural in our fallen states. Wisdom can change you as a parent. You should begin to honor God throughout your parenting and Begin to think about your child and and shape them to to honor and love the Lord. Wisdom can change your money. Being thoughtful and fair. Being generous and wise. Wisdom can change our government. As a politician or a uh, a, a official thinks about how they can uh, rule justly and make decisions that are good, and, and, and can bless those that they are overseeing and those that they are blessing, that's where wisdom can come in. Wisdom is knowing what to say, like the, the right thing to say, but also when to say it and how to say it. Wisdom is a business owner who creates a high-quality product and yet treats her employees with fairness and her customers well. See, wisdom can help us navigate the big challenges of life, the high-stakes decisions, those things that we need to make the right decision on. But wisdom can also help us navigate the normal, everyday choices we encounter. Now, verse 1, the Proverbs of Solomon, it attributes the, 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 these Proverbs to the author Solomon. He's a king. 
Now, I don't think the whole book was written by Solomon. I think we're going to encounter other authors as we go through the book of Proverbs, but I definitely think it started with him. He was the most famous, uh, his father was the most famous king of Israel, King David. And King David, towards the end of his life, he did not wait uh, to die to pass on his throne to his son. He said, I'm going to go ahead and give my son my throne. And so Solomon became king at a young age. And he went and he offered a thousand burnt offerings to the Lord. And as he was there, he began to pray. And, and then he had this dream. And God appeared to Solomon in this dream. And God asked Solomon what he could give him. Because Solomon recognized that he was young, he asked God to give him wisdom to rule over God's people Israel. And that pleased God so much that God said, I will give you wisdom, I will give you discernment, but I will also give you honor, I will give you wealth. And then right after this story in the Bible, so that appears in 1 Kings chapter 3, there's a story demonstrating Solomon's wisdom. So two women come to Solomon and they're arguing, and they're arguing over something that's terrible and that is tragic. Because one of the women that night rolled on her child and, and killed her baby, smothering her baby. And the other woman says that, that that woman then came and stole the first woman's child. So there's two babies, one died, the other mother took the baby. And so now these two women are arguing over whose child, whose baby this belongs to, and they don't have DNA testing. <laughs> I guess you could wait for the child to grow older and see who the child looks more like, but King Solomon understands that now is the time for this decision to be made. So he says, bring me a sword, and I will cut the child in half, and I will give one half to this mother and one half to that mother. And the, the real mother says, no, don't do that. Here, she can have the baby. And the false mother says, cut the child in half. I'll take half. King Solomon says, there's your mother, and gives the child to his true mom. See, he got wisdom. God gave him skill for living. Now, he is king, and as far as I know, none of us in here are king. <laughs> but we are put in our unique roles where God has called us to rule, and God has called us to govern. Maybe that's your job. Maybe that's being a parent. And every day you encounter decisions where you say, I could go this way or it could go that. And I need a little bit of God's wisdom to help me make the decision that is best. The book of Proverbs offers us that. Offers us skill for living for God every day. Now, I'm already getting into why Proverbs, but I want to look at verses 2 through 4. Because, like, why did I choose this book? It's because I, I want us to bring our relationship with God. I want us to bring God's wisdom into our everyday lives. We talk a lot about frontline ministry here at Cornerstone. Your frontline is your place that, that God has placed you throughout your, your everyday life, your Monday through Friday. Maybe it's your neighborhood. Maybe it's your coworkers. Well, we all need to be challenged and reminded of how we can bring God's presence into that situation so that you can be blessing those around you so that you can be living out the light of Christ with your community. And I think Proverbs can actually help us do that. Any time that we can bring God's wisdom into our everyday lives is a moment that God can work. When I was growing up, my, uh, my dad would come into our boys' dormitory. It's Father's Day, so here's a, a father illustration. But he would come into our boys' dormitory, dormitory. That just meant like it was uh, kind of this open area where we had a lot of different beds. Uh, and he would pray for us. And he would always pray that God would give us wisdom. So as young boys, we were getting prayed that we would receive wisdom. Now you may have heard recently on the news, this is a, a, a political illustration, but the president dropped by a church uh, in Washington, D.C. He dropped by a kind of a surprise visit, and that's actually the church that I went to when I was in Washington, D.C., uh, McLean Bible Church. Now, the pastor that was there at the time, or is now there, is not the pastor that I had, uh, but it was kind of this surprise visit, and the president asked him to pray for him. And that pastor prayed for the president to receive God's wisdom, prayed for wisdom. 
So I think that kind of goes to show, it doesn't matter if you're a child, if you're a young boy or a young girl, or you're the president of the United States, we all need wisdom. We all need God's wisdom. We all need to know how to live life the way God designed it and the way God intended. Now in verses 2 through 4, uh, 2 through 6, Proverbs gives us kind of a purpose statement. So this is still in the introduction, and it tells us why Solomon and the other authors will encounter throughout this book, why they compiled this book of Proverbs. So verse 1 again, the Proverbs of Solomon, son of David, king of Israel. Verse 2, for gaining wisdom and instruction, for understanding words of insight, for receiving instruction in prudent behavior, doing what is right and just and fair, for giving prudence to those who are simple, knowledge and discretion to the young. See, we read and we study Proverbs in order to gain wisdom. And verses 2 through 4 helps us understand what that means by broadening the definition of wisdom, by deepening it. So wisdom, uh, a form of it, can be instruction. We're going to encounter this word, musar, throughout the book. Now, when we think of instruction, we think of just someone teaching us in a classroom setting, right? But this word actually has a serious tone to it. It can involve discipline, correction, or punishment. It can include verbal rebukes or physical punishment. Like, my boss gave me firm instruction how I was wrong. That was kind of a verbal instruction, verbal correction. Or how about, uh, my father gave me a swift punishment. He instructed me how I was wrong. Well, that's a more physical instruction. But they're kind of the same word. So why Proverbs? Because even though it's not fun, it's never fun, sometimes we need correction. We need discipline. We need sometimes a punishment that puts us back on the correct course. And wouldn't it be great if we can get what we need from just reading the book of Proverbs? Let's look at that because we want that. The second word is understanding. Being. Understanding. This word describes a depth of knowledge beyond mere awareness. Like you really get it. You perceive it. It's not just, it's not just uh, how I understand like a tape measure and a hammer and nails. Like my level of understanding is about the depth of like a nice bath that we put Elijah in. It's, it's, It's not very deep. But if you were to talk with Bruce about his understanding, his level of understanding about a tape measure and nails and a hammer, it would go a lot deeper. There's a lot more cool things that he can do with those things. And he's showing me some of them, and I appreciate it. Hopefully, my level of understanding will deepen. Why Proverbs? So that we can deepen our wisdom. So that we can have, uh, so that we don't have like a shallow life. So that we don't just coast through life making whatever decision comes into our mind, but that we truly experience life how God designed it. We walk through every day understanding that, what he intends. And then knowledge, da'at. This means to know. Now wisdom uh, is not intelligence. Maybe you think like if someone's really smart, if they have a really high IQ, they must be wise. Well, that is not always the case because IQ is about logical reasoning. It's about doing things like math. Like it's important, but you can actually be really smart and make really bad decisions. You can win Jeopardy over and over and over again and be a horrible human being. That's not wisdom. Wisdom is more like EQ. You ever heard of EQ? emotional intelligence. Emotional intelligence is being self-perceptive. I know what I'm experiencing. I know my emotions. You can have control over them. Your emotions do not take control of you, and you are not pushed around by them. And it's also, it involves empathy, understanding other people's emotions, and knowing how to relate to them. That's more like wisdom, knowing how to discern life and walk through life, not, not having life control you. So you don't have to be a genius to be wise. In fact, you can kind of be stupid and wise. But wisdom requires some knowledge. It's just not knowledge that we would normally think of. 
And I think wisdom actually helps you to, to, to increase in learning, to increase in knowledge. So I don't think the word stupid is the right word. Now, as a church, we all have knowledge, right? But as a church, sometimes it's easy to get caught up in Bible knowledge. You know all these things about the Bible. You know plenty of trivia, plenty of facts, but it doesn't change our lives. It doesn't change how we worship God or or knowing him, or developing our relationships. And so I hope the book of Proverbs will be a challenge and an encouragement. If that's us, if it's just head knowledge, would it challenge us to put our knowledge into practice? That's wisdom. And if we are already putting our knowledge of the Bible and God's word into practice in our lives, that it would encourage us to keep on that path to keep walking down that path that the Lord calls us to. Because there's, there's a verse that, that Paul warns us through. He says, knowledge puffs up while love builds up. See, we don't want to grow in our Bible trivia. We want to grow in our love of God and our love of neighbor. We want to grow in our, in our capacity to honor God in every part of our lives. And then what other things uh, does wisdom do? It, it helps cultivate righteousness, justice, and fairness. See, as we grow in wisdom, it should change not only how we live, but how we interact with those around us. It should change our culture, our society. So as we, as a church, grow in wisdom, that should affect our culture. It should affect how we interact with each other. And then as that permeates us, it should permeate out into our world, into our front lines, into our, our town, into our community, so that justice and righteousness and fairness influence and saturate this whole area. And so, why Proverbs? Because it can change our lives. And then who is Proverbs for? A better way of asking this question is, who is wisdom for? Who is wisdom for? It's for everyone. <laughs> Wisdom is for everyone. Everyone gets a car. <laughs> you guys look a little tired, so I'm just throwing in an Oprah reference. <laughs> Verses 4, 5, and 6 say this. Wisdom is for giving prudence to those who are simple, knowledge and discretion to the young. Let the wise listen and add to their learning, and let the discerning guide Get guidance for understanding proverbs and parables and sayings and riddles of the wise. So we see the simple in there. Who are they? Well, the simple are neither foolish nor wise. It's kind of like the, the starting point. You're just a clean slate. Or maybe you've kind of not gone one way or the other. Well, the book of Proverbs is for you. It can help you grow. How about if you're young uh, throughout the book of Proverbs, we're going to see him talking to my son. Now, that does not mean that the book of Proverbs is only for teenage boys. It's not, but it's kind of written for them. And they're kind of, that's the, kind of the, the, the target audience, but it's, it's for lots of people. It's for anyone, right? Paul writes letters to the Corinthians, but we don't think, oh, it only applies to the Corinthians. I can't read it. No, we read it and we learn from it. So anyone can learn and understand from this wisdom and apply it to their own context. And then wisdom is for the wise. The book of Proverbs is for the wise, for those who are already discerning, because we all have something to learn. Even if you are so wise that you already have your own genre of wisdom, like a Bernieism or something like that, like you can still learn something from the book of Proverbs. Proverbs is for everyone. And what's the big idea of Proverbs? So this leads up, our preamble, our introduction leads up to this, this verse that can be a key verse, a key proverb for our life. It can be a kind of a life proverb. And it's nice that the book of, although I've put it at the end of my message, the book of Proverbs has put it at the very front because it is a key this little proverb is a key, verse 7, to unlock the entire book of Proverbs. So I want to read it because it, it, it talks about the fear of the Lord, which is a theme that we're going to see over and over again through the book of Proverbs. Verse 7, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. So if you had to choose only one proverb... To live your life by, I hope it wouldn't be cleanliness is next to godliness. 
but that it would be this proverb. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. What is the fear of the Lord? It's this reverent awe of God. It's a reverent awe of who God is and understanding that that we, we need to take him seriously. Dr. Bruce Waltke says, you really believe his promises are secure and his threats are real. You you believe that God's promises are true, they're secure, they're going to happen, but his threats are also just as real. That's the fear of the Lord, understanding that we are called to be holy and yet we are incredibly loved. That, that we are to go out and obey God in our lives, and if we disobey, we're foolish and there will be consequences. And this is not just a fear of any God, this is fear of our God. This word for Lord here, if you look in your Bibles, it's an uppercase. And that means it's the special covenant name of God, Yahweh. This is the special name of, of the God of the Old Testament, who's our God too, who is revealed through Christ Jesus, Yahweh. And so this isn't fear based on abstract knowledge. This is fear and reverence based on a relationship, a relationship with the one true God. It's fear like a young boy has of his loving father. He is afraid that his father, if he does something wrong, will correct him. But he's also a bit afraid because he knows that that same father would be willing to lay down his life at a moment's notice for him. And I don't know if correction strikes more fear in the heart or sacrifice. I actually think it's the second one. And as we think of the, the God of the Bible, the God who, 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 who breathed Proverbs into life, as we think about the whole story, we remember that our God, he is not afraid to correct us. And he has already laid down the life of his son, Christ Jesus, for us. And that should strike fear in our hearts, a reverent awe in our hearts. Wisdom begins with the fear of the Lord. It's the big idea of this message. Wisdom begins with the fear of the Lord, but it's also really the big idea of Proverbs. Let me pray.